Hello, Mammalogy. Um, welcome to your next online lecture. Um, I did hear back from a bunch of you about uh, whether you preferred the YouTube lectures or trying to do an, uh, a real-time type of lecture through Zoom. And everybody who got back to me said that they prefer the, um, the YouTube version so that they can watch the lecture at their own time. So that's what we'll do going forward. Um, just some reminders before we get started. Um, don't forget that we have those hypothesis online discussions every Tuesday. So make sure you guys are getting on there and doing those ones. I'll try and keep ahead of you so that you can read the papers in advance if you like. But I do suggest that you try to do this pretty close to Tuesday. That way you'll be interacting with your peers a little bit more in the annotations. And I think that'll make it a little more interesting. Um, I did get all your exams graded. Um, the average on the exam was an 84. Um, a lot of B's um, and the B's were really largely because I was looking because it was an open book open note exam I was looking for more detail than a lot of you guys gave me um, So next time for the final when we have the final um, Just give me a little bit more detail and if you weren't totally happy with your grade last time that'll probably uh, Help you improve your grade for the next time. Um, I did send out uh, a message with the two remaining lab assignments um, we are doing some zoo observations and also you're going to be creating a dichotomous key for either bats or shrews. Um, that dichotomous key can be a little tricky, so if you have questions, make sure you contact me. And then don't forget that you have to do your mammal life history papers and presentations. Um, I did put instructions for that on Blackboard. Um, but I will be sending out an email with more instructions as well as a little video showing you how to make your own Zoom videos. Because what I'm going to ask you guys to do is create a PowerPoint um, for a five minute presentation and then record yourself giving the presentation. And then everybody's going to watch each other's presentations and um, evaluate the presentations on the different mammals. Um, so that's gonna be happening um, that last week of classes. So the, the PowerPoint video is gonna be due on Monday of that week. Um, and then the, the full life history paper, the written paper is gonna be due um, at the end of that week, okay? Um, so those are my announcements. Again, any questions you have, feel free to email or um, you guys have my numbers, you can call me as well. Um, but let's get going with our uh, material for today, which is on uh, population ecology in mammals. This is chapter 26. Um, so most of you have probably had um, our ecology class, so you should know by now that what a population is. So, you know, a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area that are interacting, breeding, and competing with each other and are kind of a contiguous group. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is how we study populations in mammals and um, the kind of the population ecology kind of component of this class. So, of course, populations are dynamic. Um, they don't stay the same over time and population size really changes a lot. Um, so just for five seconds here, or you could pause the video, think about what influences population size, what influences whether a population is growing or whether a population is shrinking. So think about that for just a few minutes, few seconds. Um, the four things that you'd be interested in if, to understand whether a population is growing or shrinking are gonna be the birth rate, the death rate, um, and then immigration or emigration. So individuals that are, are entering or leaving that population. And um, those four components are gonna explain whether um, the population is growing or shrinking. So whenever the births and immigrations combined are more than the deaths and emigrations, then the population is going to grow. Um, however, if the births and immigrations are less than the deaths and immigrations, then you expect the population to shrink. Okay, and so population ecology is very often very involved in understanding these different components. All right, um, so to understand these different components, we often um, study what we call population demography. Um, and the demography of a population is involved with its age structure. So uh, how many young individuals do you have? How many middle-aged individuals do you have? How many old individuals do you have? Um, 
And what you can do to kind of build this, this picture of the population is to follow what we call a cohort of individuals through time. So you take all the individuals that were, say, born in 2018, and you can follow them through, through time. So how many were born, how many survived to be one-year-old, how many survived to be two-year-old, um, et cetera. And then as they reach sexual maturity, then you're going to be interested in uh, fecundity rates. Fecundity is simply the number of offspring that are produced in a standard period of time. For most mammals, we're going to be talking about a year because um, that's the reproductive cycle that, that is relevant for most mammals. Um, and then you also want to know the mortality rate. So what's the probability of dying? Um, again, usually that's in a year. Now, fecundity and mortality can be age specific. So what that means is that there, um, there may be some ages where an individual has more offspring and some ages where an individual has fewer offspring. Same thing goes for mortality. You can expect that mortality rates may vary at different ages. Um, immigration and emigration also are things that are going to be important to understand as well. And those also can have an age component. For example, we talked about um, dispersal um, in the last uh, lecture. And dispersal often happens when individuals are young. So you might get more immigrants and emigrants uh, in those younger age classes than you would expect in some of those older age classes. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, life history traits and how that influences populations. Um, natural selection is always going to, to favor traits that maximize the, the total number of offspring that an individual leaves. Um, and there's two things that influence um, reproductive success. And in order to have reproductive success, you have to survive and you have to reproduce. Um, and so, uh, because you could be the, you know, you, you could be a, a, a Dr. Claire, you could live a long time and not have any kids and have very low fitness. I have extremely low fitness. I have a fitness of zero because I have no offspring. Um, or uh, you could be a very fecund individual, have a lot of potential. Let's say you're a, a, a male with a really great, uh, a male deer with a really great rack. And, um, but if you die before you get a chance to reproduce, you're also gonna have low fitness. So you have to both survive and reproduce. And there's basically kind of two different strategies um, that animals tend to have. Um, there are animals that um, tend to live for a long time and reproduce slowly. And there's animals that tend to live for a short time and reproduce quickly. So um, an example of a, uh, an, what we, an animal of what we would call a slow life history would be elephants. So elephants don't become sexually mature um, until I believe, oof, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere around like, I think seven or eight years old. Um, so they're not sexually mature until they're, um, for, for many years, um, they only have one offspring at a time and they only have one offspring every two to three years. So they're reproducing very slowly, but then again, they live a very long time. So an elephant can live 60 or 70 years. Um, so they have a, a lot of opportunity to have offspring over that long lifespan. Um, on the other uh, end of the scale, an animal with very fast life history would be an opossum. Uh, opossums can have 12 or 13 babies at a time. Um, they can reproduce more than once per year. They re can start reproducing at less than a year old, um, but they only live about two and a half years. So they have a very, very short lifespan. Um, sometimes you'll hear these two different life history strategies referred to as R selected for the short life histories and K selected for the long life histories, although that terminology is kind of falling out of favor to a certain extent. So basically what you see is that you have this trade-off <clears throat> between survival and reproduction. Um, and uh, so you, what you tend to see is that animals that live for a long time tend to reproduce more slowly. Animals that live for a very short period of time tend to re reproduce very quickly. Now, part of the reason for that is if you have a high probability of dying, um, then it, it is evolutionarily advantageous to invest as much energy as possible into reproduction uh, and reproduce as quickly and as often as possible, even at the expense of maintaining yourself. Um, so if, let's say you're a prey animal, it's likely that something is gonna eat you regardless of what condition you're in. 
um, then it makes it's it's uh, more beneficial to invest a whole lot of resources into reproducing as quickly and as often as possible. Whereas if you are very likely to survive for a very long time, then it is usually more advantageous to invest more resources in yourself because then you'll have more opportunities to breed in the future. And if you had used all of your resources to breed in a short period of time, then you wouldn't have all of those future opportunities because you have that trade-off of investing all of that eight, that energy into uh, reproduction. So survival and fecundity are very, very tightly um, connected. Um, all right. Okay, so that brings us to how we can use survival and fecundity to um, assess whether a population is growing or shrinking. So hopefully most of you have had 352 and you were introduced to life tables in that class. Um, but um, this here is an example of a life table. Um, what a life table tells you is um, survivorship and fecundity at different age classes. So over here we have the age of the animals. Um, so starting at birth with age zero and then you most of the time these are going to be years, so one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, etc. going down. Um, when, at birth, everybody's alive, okay? So at, at the start, you have a survivorship of 100%. That means that everybody who is born is there because they were just born. Um, this survivorship number is going to drop um, between each year um, based on the number of individuals who die from age zero to age one, from age one to age two. So for example, at age one, only 80% of the individuals who are originally alive are still alive. Um, at age two, there's only 60% of the original individuals. Age three is 40%, et etc. et cetera, until you get to the point where there's no remaining individuals. All right, so that's survivorship. Fecundity is the average number of offspring that are produced by an individual of that age class. So at birth, you would not expect to see any offspring because they were just born. So there's zero fecundity. One-year-olds maybe are not terribly successful at producing offspring in this particular example. Um, so young individuals, maybe they don't have the resources. They're not very successful. They don't produce very many offspring. There's usually a peak kind of in middle life when the individual is an experienced breeder, they have access to resources that you see that, that they need to reproduce. So usually you see that peak of fecundity in the middle of life. And then towards the end of life, you tend to see a drop off um, where the animal is going into a senescent phase and maybe they're less reproductively capable at that age. Um, all right, now in order to figure out um, whether a population is growing or shrinking, in order for a individual female, and all of these life tables uh, just by standard are measured in um, females only. So we're talking about how the average number of female offspring and the average survivorship of females because females are the ones who do reproduce. Um, so in order to tell for a, a population to remain stable, the uh, population, ha each female has to on average produce one female offspring, right? Um, because then she is replaced within the population, the population remains stable. So um, in order to calculate whether a population is growing or shrinking, you can calculate this number here, R0. Um, and R0 is simply the sum of the survivorship, which is de denoted L sub X, the survivorship at a particular age class times the fecundity at that age class, which is this number over here, and then you add those up for each year and that the sum over the, the lifespan of the animal will give you R0, okay? Now, if R0 is one, that means the population is stable. It's neither growing nor shrinking. If R0 is above one, then the population is growing. And if R0 is below one, then the population is shrinking, okay? Um, so be familiar with this formula. Um, you don't have to memorize it. Uh, but uh, you, I might give you a life table on an exam and ask you to calculate whether the population is growing or shrinking. So you'll need to know how to deal with this formula, okay? All right, so um, populations that are growing, um, one type of population growth is what we call exponential growth. Um, and exponential growth is growth that um, increases more and more rapidly over time. 
Um, so you tend to see exponential growth in populations when they've been either introduced to a new area, so somewhere where they never were before. So they move in and there's no competition, there's no predators. And so you'll see exponential growth of that population. Or if there's been relief from other factors that were limiting growth. So for example, restoring habitat or stopping hunting of an animal. That's when you'll tend to see this exponential growth. Um, so let's think a minute about that, those life history strategies. You can have ac exponential growth in a, um, a species that has uh, an R selected or a fast life history. And you can also have exponential growth in a species that has a slow life history. But if you think about that curve, how would you expect that to differ between those fast life history animals and those slow life history animals? Well, the fast life history animals are gonna increase much more rapidly. So that curve is gonna be steeper. You'll still get an exponential curve uh, for a slow life history animal. It's just gonna be a little bit of a shallower curve. It won't be quite so steep. Okay, now populations cannot grow forever. They eventually become limited. Um, and this is what we call, um, uh, well, we call population limitation. Um, so oftentimes populations are limited by factors that are related to the, the number of individuals in the population. We call these density dependent factors, okay? Now, um, density dependent factors, basically there's some sort of limiting resource. There's a number of different possible limiting resources that can cause um, density dependent uh, limitation of population growth, um, like food or habitat or predators. Um, and as the, the population gets larger, as the density of that population increases, that, um, that factor has a greater impact on the population. So that's what gives us this uh, kind of logistic curve. This is called a logistic growth curve here. Um, so it starts out looking like an exponential growth curve, but what happens is as you reach the carrying capacity, this is the maximum number of individuals that the population can support. As you reach the carrying capacity, the growth rate is gonna slow down and eventually it's gonna stabilize around that carrying capacity. So that's a hypothetical one here. This one down here is a, an example from fur seals. Fur seals were hunted nearly to extinction um, because they're furry seals and people wanted their pelts. Um, and when hunting stopped, the population initially increased quite rapidly, but then eventually it stabilized and leveled off at the carrying capacity. So this is the number of fur seals that the population can actually support. Um, so this formula over here um, will allow you to calculate the rate of growth uh, give, if you are given information about that particular um, population. So um, the rate of growth is DNDT, calculus, you guys, I know. Um, but DNDT um, basically is saying the change in population over a certain amount of time. So this is a rate of growth, okay? Um, and then that is determined by the intrinsic growth rate. So this R number is going to be determined for each species um, and uh, species that are uh, have a fast life history are gonna tend to have larger Rs than species with a slow life history. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate that in this class. If I need you to know that, I'll, I'll give you what the intrinsic growth rate is. N is the current um, population size. Um, and then this, factor here takes into account the carrying capacity. So again, n is the population size, k is your carrying capacity. So if you think about this little um, formula here, where n and k are equal, so if the population is at carrying capacity, then this number in the parentheses, this, this number will be one, n divided by k, when n and k are equal will be one. Um, so one minus one is zero, this part will be zero. So the, the change in population size when you're at carrying capacity is gonna be zero. That means that your population is gonna be stable, okay? Um, if uh, the population size is below carrying capacity, so if this number is smaller than this number, then the number in the parentheses here will be larger than one. And so the growth rate, DNDT, will be a positive number. If n is larger than the carrying capacity, so if you're above this line here, 
then this number in the parentheses will be a negative number, and so the population will be shrinking. Um, and so this formula can allow you to determine how quickly the population is either growing or shrinking um, given different conditions, okay? So again, I might ask you to, I might give you some numbers and ask you to calculate something like that um, on an exam. So that's all density dependent limitation. There are also things that can limit population growth that are density independent. So it doesn't matter how many individuals there are in the population. Um, something is going to impact that that prevents the population from growing for some reason. All right. Um, so we're going to look at a number of different limiting factors and think about whether they're density dependent or density independent. Um, so we're going to look at some uh, habitat, food, and natural enemies and then think about some of the human causes that might be limiting populations. So many species of mammals are limited by uh, human activity. All right, so let's start with habitat. Um, habitat, of course, is really, really important for populations. Um, and um, so habitat can determine on the number of individuals that can persist in a particular area. So um, areas that have high quality habitat often can support larger populations of individuals than, um, than areas with low quality habitat. Um, and uh, so for example, um, for a lot of animals require a fairly large range. Um, this example here is looking at um, uh, a mouse lemur in Madagascar and looking at um, chunks of uh, habitat that are either occupied or not occupied by these little mouse lemurs. Um, and what you see is that um, not only uh, are there more larger population sizes of lemurs in larger habitat chunks, um, but also that these larger chunks are actually better habitat and they're more likely to be occupied by lemurs at all. So very small chunks of habitat often, um, even though they could potentially support lemurs, um, they, they don't. All right. Um, another, so th this would be an example of, um, this would be an example of a density dependent uh, factor where um, the, the lemurs are, their populations are growing to match the size of the habitat fragment. So these larger fragments can hold a larger number of lemurs, but eventually they're still going to max out and those populations are going to be limited by the fragment size. Okay. Um, this other example over here is uh, pandas. So this weird shape here is the historical range of giant pandas and the little red speckles here are where panda habitat still remains. Um, so when you have habitat destruction, um, that tends to be, which is what is limiting the panda uh, populations right now, is that humans have come in and cut down their, the bamboo forest that they rely on. Um, when you have habitat destruction, that tends to be a density independent factor, because it doesn't matter how many pandas there are or pandas there were, if the forest gets cut down, it's going to prevent there from being pandas. Right, so it's not density dependent. It doesn't matter if there were two pandas in the forest or 200 pandas in the forest. If you cut the forest down, the pandas aren't gonna be there anymore. So that would be density independent, okay? All right, let's take a look at some uh, population limitations for uh, food. Um, so we've got a few examples here. So food, of course, is a really big limiting factor. If you don't have enough food, you can't, um, you can't survive. Um, so food is something that is, not always constant either. Um, so one example would be the the uh, short-tailed shrew. Um, you know how I feel about shrews, you guys. But um, these guys, um, their populations grow very rapidly during the summer months. Their main food source is insects. And so in the summer months, insects are quite abundant and they have lots of access to food. In the winter months, um, however, there's much less food. And so what you see is the population grows very rapidly during the summer when food is available. And then in the winter, when food levels decline, the population declines. Um, again, that's something that's not density dependent. It doesn't matter if there were a lot of shrews or a few shrews to start with, their populations are still gonna grow in the summer when there's food availability and their populations are gonna shrink in the winter because there's just not as, as well. They, actually, they don't, they don't starve to death. What happens is 
that there's not enough food for them to reproduce. And these guys get eaten by a lot of things. And so when they're, um, when they're not reproducing, then the population declines. And then when they are reproducing in the summer, when there's more abundant food, the population grows again. Um, so that's, a, that's one example of a seasonal change. This is an example, again, uh, with uh, sea lions, um, that where humans have actually overfished um, the, the food that these guys rely on. And so because there's less food available for them, their population has declined. Um, and this is an example where basically humans have lowered the carrying capacity that the, pop, that the um, environment can support. Um, and then this last example is looking at uh, the, the lynx population, which is in red here, and how that is impacted by their main food source, the snowshoe hare. So when snowshoe hare populations are high, the lynx population can grow and it will increase. But then when snowshoe hare populations are low, the lynx population also will crash. And so they're limited by their availability of their favorite food. Um, Flipping the script on that one, you can also look at the snowshoe hares and see how their populations are impacted by the lynx. So when um, lynx populations are high, snowshoe hare populations decline. And then when lynx populations are low, the snowshoe hares can recover and come back. Um, and so these two are, are connected to each other, one because they're limited by their food and the other because they're limited by their predators. And they, so they cycle together in a very predictable pattern. Um, another example of limitation by a natural enemy, enemy, enemy would be bighorn sheep. Um, so bighorn sheep um, are very susceptible to a lungworm parasite. Um, and what they found is that um, they, their populations were limited by this parasite. Uh, when they were at high density, um, it was easy for that parasite to be transmitted from one individual to another. And, um, and that caused a crash down to a lower density, but then at that lower density, the parasite wasn't able to transmit as readily. Um, and so this is, again, an example of a density dependent factor where um, the having too high of a density of sheep actually led to an increase in the impact of that disease until the, the population got low enough um, for the, the species to not be as impacted. All right, um, all right, so let's think a little bit now about um, how humans are influencing these populations. Um, and there's actually five major ways that, um, that humans can impact wild populations. Um, the, those five ways are through pollution of the environment, habitat destruction, over harvesting, um, introduced species, uh, so moving species from one location to another, and then also climate change. So what I'd like you guys to do for a little uh, take home exercise, I'm gonna make a um, uh, place on the discussion board for you guys to do this. Um, and by the way, these discussion board things, there is a partic participation component of this class. So whenever you participate with the discussion board, then that's counting towards your uh, participation for the class. Um, so what I'd like you guys to think about is uh, pick one of these uh, five things that impacts a particular species or a particular type of species. Um, think about how the species are impacted. Do you think it's a density dependent or a density independent um, example? And write up a little blurb on the discussion board. All right. Um, so that's it for this lecture. Um, I do, I did have a request um, from the uh, Rio Ramos fan club that Rio make an appearance in my next video. And he has been lying here. I don't know if you guys have heard him. He's been lying here groaning throughout this entire lecture because I'm not paying enough attention to him. And now, of course, he is ignoring me. Rio's a good dog. Yes. All right. Uh, hope you guys are good. See you soon.